Just to wrap up everything, we need to go back to a few texts. Here, God speak to us through the texts as we finalize on the day. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you that once again as we close within the constraints of the few minutes we have, may you just remind us on the danger of having little faith. In this day, God, allow me to contrast two levels of faith. Bless us, and God speak to our hearts, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved, allow me to speak of a giant who had a little faith. You know, when you see somebody and you expect them to have the greatest faith, then they manifest lack of faith. It's scary. The text for study is Matthew 14. In the morning, we did Matthew 15 from verse 21. Now, let's start Matthew 14 from verse 22. The Bible says, and straight away Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship to go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Now, you need to understand the context of this text. Jesus constrained, Jesus compelled, Jesus insisted to the disciples that disciples get into the boat and go to the other side. And why must Jesus compel them? You need to have a clearer picture. And I think this was not captured by Matthew. You know, Matthew is uh, the tax collector. Matthew goes for the bigger details and, and, and he looks at uh, things like how many people were there. He looks at the fact that they are going to the other side. There is the beloved apostle who was staying close and, and he it goes into further details. And by the way, when you go into the book of John chapter 6, the Bible says of the same story, it says in John chapter 6 and reading from verses 13, Therefore they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which remained over and above that they had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is of a truth, the prophet that should come into the world. This is the Messiah. Beloved, there is something about food that makes people loved. When Jesus fed them, they loved Jesus. When Jesus rebuked them, they hated him. Esh, go and give somebody five shillings right now. He will look at you. And doesn't consider you so seriously. Give somebody five times ten raised to power six in terms of money. That person is likely to praise you irrespective of who you are. And, and, and this, in fact, I, 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 I read in the book Desire of Ages, it says that the works of healing that they had witnessed were such as only divine power could perform. But the miracle of the loaves appealed to everyone in the vast multitude. All were sharers of the benefit. When Jesus is healing people, somebody can say, that wasn't my mother who was healed. That was not my relative. But when it was feeding everyone, shared the benefit, and after that, they wanted to make him the ruler. As you've seen it with the politicians, they give people handkerchiefs and loaves of bread in campaign time, and everyone wants to vote them in, expecting that when they go in, there will be loaves every day. And hardly have they gone in than the supply of loaves end. But Jesus gives them this and feeds them out of compassion and Jesus wants them to learn something. In fact, in John chapter 6, Jesus says, you follow me not because of the words which you heard, but because you are filled with loaves. And beloved, I'll warn us, let's not be the kinds of people who are filled with loaves and that's why we are following Jesus. Let us follow Jesus because we've had an experience with him. And I'm going to tell you something about faith. The giant with a little faith. 
The text says in verses 15 of John chapter 6, when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed into a mountain himself alone. Now, John says that, Matthew did not say it. They wanted to make Jesus king by force because he fed them. And, and let me tell you something. Let me tell you, when Jesus does certain things, in the moment of success, it is easy to say, praise God. In the moment when things are going on well, it is easy to want to make king Jesus. Everyone wants the king when they are being fed. But when he rebukes you, you don't want to call him king. You must call him Lord even when he rebukes you. And that was the lesson in the morning. And let's look at these people who are desirous to make him king. In fact, even the apostles wanted Jesus to be made king. I have done my study on this and I have understood that when Jesus was sending them away, Jesus sent them away by boat because Jesus saw that their schemes were on a temporal kingdom. They were eager. And you read the text. It says in Matthew 14, reading from verse 23. When he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. Beloved, we must have time for prayer alone. When the multitudes, there are moments, by the way, so many of us are not able to pray because of the multitudes. This one is saying this, WhatsApp is saying this, Facebook is saying this, and everywhere is saying this and that. Mass media, social media, print media, every media is saying this and that. A time has to come when you have to go to the mountain and have an experience with God. Why did Jesus go to the mountain? Desire of Ages 379, paragraph 1 says, When left alone, Jesus went up into the mountain apart to pray. For hours he continued pleading with God, not for himself, but for men were those prayers. He prays for the power to reveal to men the divine character of his mission that Satan might not blind their understanding and pervert their judgment. Listen to that. God went to pray, and beloved, we need to go apart and pray. My parting message to us is go and pray. Some of us may think we have faith. We have very little faith. Some of us are giants in the church, but with very little faith. So let me deal with a giant with a little faith. And, and, and the Bible says in verses 24, But the sheep was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. Now that goes too fast. That goes too fast. Why do I say so as a preacher? Because it just says they were in the midst of the sea without Jesus. Beloved, the storm is coming. You must know how to handle the storm. Let me explain to us what made them have this storm and why God allowed the storm to come so that he can be able to speak to them and bring them to a realization of what they need. In the times of a crisis, you need to remember what is critical and what you need. That's what we call faith. In the morning I said great faith is being able to stand for God even in the moment of a crisis. Desire of Ages says, The Savior knew that his days of personal ministry on earth were nearly ended, and that few would receive him as their redeemer. In travail and conflict of soul, he prayed for his disciples. They were to be grievously tried. Their long-cherished hopes, based on popular delusion, were to be disappointed in the most painful and humiliating manner. So Jesus allows them to separate, and they go. And what were they saying as they went? By the way, it's good, it's good to explain to you this part so that you understand. You know, uh, one of the things that is normally characteristic of God's children, on a Sabbath like this, after the Sabbath, what are the stories you make as you live? As you live here, what are the stories you tell? Some of our stories interfere with the message that we had in the old day. You, you, you know those one button you press and it deletes everything like that. You just leave the gate over here and one of the 
things that you're going to say wherever you are. For the Sabbath hours, you are fine. You are fine. Sitting at the feet of Jesus. Those who are the things you are singing. And, and just one moment you press a reset button. You go back to Friday. And, and when, when we look at this, allow me to read for you. The disciples, listen to this, how the messenger to the remnant says, the disciples had not put off immediately from the land as Jesus had directed them. They waited for a time, hoping that he would come to them. But when they saw that darkness was fast approaching, they entered the ship and went over to Capernaum. They had left Jesus with dissatisfied hearts, more impatient with him than ever before since acknowledging him as their Lord, they murmured because they had not been permitted to proclaim him as king. They blamed their se themselves for yielding so readily to his command. They reasoned that if they had been more persistent, they may have accomplished their purpose. So murmuring as they were leaving. Not only murmuring. In fact, the messenger to the remnant says, and belief was taking possession of their minds and love of honor had blinded them. Everyone wanted Jesus to be an earthly king so that they can sit on his right hand side. People were jostling for positions. You think it started with the politicians. It's been there for a long time. Politicians, in fact, I like Kenyan politicians for some reason. They, they, they just say the truth of who they are. They don't lie to you. They look for us. We are not lying. We are selfish. That's it. They will admit in front of the camera that for us, we are selfish. We are caring about ourselves. And Jesus saw the danger of his disciples. Beloved, when Jesus sees the danger of his disciples taking the popular trends of the world, Jesus will allow something to happen to shake them up. And that's why when you, when you read this text, it says that they went... And as they went, they started thinking in their minds. The messenger to the remnant says, they started thinking and they were asking themselves, were they always to be accounted as followers of a false prophet? Would Christ never assert his authority? You know, they've gone and preached to people that Jesus is powerful. But when after Jesus has fed people, when they want to make him king, Jesus goes away. They started murmuring among themselves, could it be that we've trusted the wrong God. Beloved, you know when things happen and, and, and you start questioning. In fact, the messenger to the remnant says, they question, could Jesus be an imposter as the Pharisees asserted? With this kind of things in their minds, beloved, I have come to admit that it is good what you feed in your head. Even your thoughts affect how you go through the whole day. What gets into your thought process? Desire of Ages, page 380, paragraph 3 says, The disciples had that day witnessed the wonderful works of Christ. It seemed that heaven had come down. The memory of the precious and glorious day should have filled them with hope. Had they, out of the abundance of their hearts, been conversing together in regards to these things, they would not have entered into temptation. Beloved, some of the reasons we enter into temptation is we get into the wrong conversation. If we can be able only to continue thinking positively of the things that Jesus told us during the day. The Sabbath has come to an end. You are going to go home. What is in your mind? Are you worried about the level of faith you have? If it worries you, and you think about it, and you think of how to make it better, you will be helped out of temptation. But the disciples, instead of thinking of the glorious things God had done, the glorious things that Jesus himself had done, they started thinking of other things. Worldly honor. But their disappointment had absorbed their thoughts. When they allowed disappointment to absorb their thoughts, Great controversy, not great controversy, but Desire of Ages says, they were in the midst of the troubled waters. 
Their thoughts were stormy and unreasonable, and the Lord gave them something else to afflict their souls and occupy their mind. God often does this when men create burdens and troubles for themselves. The disciples had no need to make trouble. Already danger was fast approaching. Now listen as I explain. They made trouble for themselves. Beloved, do you know at times you can make trouble for yourself? You can just look at things and start thinking in your mind, thinking in your mind, overthinking and stretching your mind. They made trouble for themselves. And let me tell you, when men make trouble for themselves with their stormy thoughts, God allows them to get into a storm. So that in the midst of the storm, it could be that a storm will shake them to think right. And that's why God allowed this. A violent tempest came. And the sea was so shaken that they forgot all the things. Let me tell you something. You are worried about who is greater when things are calm. Let me tell you, if you are told that there is corona in your office where you work, you don't ask who is the boss. When trouble comes, let me ask you, terrorists have come to the building where you are working. Do you start arguing that why have they not made me the boss? You first deal with the danger. Promotion will come afterwards. Right now, it is survival. And let me tell you, God allowed the storm. And when God allowed the storm, I, I see something interesting. Uh, during the storm, as all these things is happening, in the storm, God had taught them their own helplessness. And at times, God allows us to get into a storm to teach us our own helplessness. And let me tell you, who needs this lesson? Those who are Jews. Remember the Gentile in the morning? I'd already admitted over truth. What you said is true. We are dogs. That was faith. But those who are knowledgeable are the ones who spend a lot of time. Let me tell you, like right now, even in church, you will find people fighting for church positions. Church positions. Church positions. In fact, I thank God at times for things like Corona. At least we are relaxed. We are relaxed. So that you don't fight for the positions so much. You first fight to survive. God allowed the storm. And, and when you look, well, one thing I like about Jesus, eish, you know Jesus is just Jesus. When you are in a storm, you think like he has forgotten. Jesus does not forget. In fact, when I was doing a study into this, I learned that Jesus was seated, watching them as they are going, and seeing what they are saying, how they are talking, and what is troubling them. And even when the tempest started, Jesus saw. In fact, I like the way Desire of Ages puts it again. It says, not for a moment did Jesus lose sight of his disciples. Beloved, when you are going through tough times, God has not lost sight of you. So please don't lose sight of God. He doesn't lose sight of his disciples. And one thing I have learned, with the deepest solicitude, he follows them through the storm. And he sees them through the storm, the men who are to be the light of the world, and, and, and Jesus watches them. But when their hearts were subdued, and in humility they cried for help, the Bible says that Jesus begins to walk towards them. Let me tell you, not until we will stop focusing on the troubles and the storms and we focus and cry to God for help. When we cry to God for help, he will come. Because he's always been there waiting for some sinner to pray. He's always been there just waiting for you to ask for help. In fact, the Bible says, At the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled. They said, it's a spirit. They cried out of fear. Beloved, this is another interesting one. There are some people, when Jesus is coming to help you, you run away from Jesus. So they see Jesus, their only source of help, and they are crying, it's a ghost. 
Some of us will never be helped because where we can get help, we look at Jesus like a ghost. The moment you define Jesus as a ghost, you're not going to get help from him. Because you are terrified of him. Jesus loves you. Jesus is saying, come unto me. And listen, I, I like the way the Bible says that Jesus spoke to them and said, be of good cheer. It is I, be not afraid. That's good. Jesus always comforts us that be of good cheer. I am the one. Don't be afraid. Uh, and then I, I, I like the giant Peter. Peter answered and said, Lord, if it is you, tell me to come to thee. Now, that one looks simple. God, if it is you, tell me to come. Now, to me, that is not the big thing. The big thing is when he steps off. Eish. If it is you, tell me to come. Then Jesus says, okay, come. He stepped off. Now, that is serious. But wait, what is the level of faith? It takes faith to say and shout when everyone thinks it's popular. You can shout and say, if it is you, tell me to come. And he jumps off the ship. And looks like he's walking. And look at the text. It says, and he said, Jesus said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. He begins, hey, beloved, how many of you have ever walked on water? But walking on water is not the big thing. Where are you walking to? You can walk on water everywhere. Let me tell you. Just walk on water if it is Jesus who has called you. And, and he walks on water. And listen to what the Bible says. It says, but when he saw the wind boister us, he was afraid and began to sink. Now listen. When he saw the winds, he saw. Beloved, there's a problem with the things we see. When Jesus tells you, come, you start walking. And so many people have started walking. I have seen a people who listen to God and sermons are preached and they give their lives to Jesus and they begin walking with Jesus and they are walking on the sea of life with Jesus. But let me tell you something, when they see the winds, the winds just begin to blow. When they see the waves beginning to move, what, do they, what happens? They become afraid. Afraid. When Jesus called you, by the way, do, do, do you know what happens? When there is a crusade and Jesus calls you, you say, I don't care what they will say. You say, I have given my life to Jesus. I am living false worship. I am coming to worship the true God. And you say, I don't care. But you come to church. After two months, the winds of gossip come. And now you're like, Eish, I'm going to leave this church. Terrified. Winds. Trouble comes, the winds just blow a little bit, and we are terrified. And it says that he began to sink. Now, beloved, listen to this. When you lose your sight of Jesus, you will begin to sink. That is the point, and that is the summary of this sharing. Lose sight of Jesus, you begin to sink. Looking unto Jesus, Peter walks securely. But as in self-satisfaction, he glances back towards his companions in the boat. His eyes are turned from the Savior. That's how the pen of inspiration puts it. Beloved, let me tell you something. Set your minds on things above. Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Too many of us are walking. They began by looking unto Jesus. Now they are looking unto others. In fact... When Peter cast his eyes off the master, the wind was boisterous, the waves are rolling high, and it comes directly between him and the master. The waves will always do that. They come between us and Jesus. But faith looks and sticks on Jesus, not on the circumstances. And when this happens, Peter begins to sink. But one thing I like about Peter, which is an object lesson I want us to pick, when Peter began to sink, he knew whom to call. So many of us, when we begin to sink, we don't know whom to call. 
Peter began to sink, uh, and the Bible says that when he began to sink, he said, Lord, save me. Today, there is somebody who has been troubled by the winds and is beginning to sink. The only thing you should say is, Lord, save me. Three words, Lord, save me. Beloved, I love salvation because it is that simple. Three words, Lord, save me. You don't need to capture so many things that, Lord, you remember. I understand that there is sanctification, justification, and glorification. Listen, beloved, there is time for that. Right now you are thinking, we don't go into theological understanding of how to be saved. You just say, Lord, save me. And Peter said that, and the Bible says, immediately, and I like that. Anyone who asks for Jesus' help, Jesus saves you immediately. So today, are you feeling weak? Ask for help immediately. He will save you. And the Bible says, immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, why did you doubt? I am through with the text. Now I'm just explaining the text. You of little faith, why did you doubt? When you started walking with Jesus, you stepped out of the ship. That was nice. But let me tell you something, beloved. It's not enough to start walking with Jesus. It's wonderful to continue walking and keep your eyes on Jesus. The songwriter says, look upon Jesus. Sinless is he. Father, impute his life unto me, my life of scarlet, my sin and woe, cover with his life, whiter than snow, cover with his life, whiter than snow, fullness of his life, then shall I know. My life of scarlet, my sin and woe, cover with this life, white that Look upon Jesus, beloved, set your eyes on Jesus is my challenge message this evening. Allow me to finish with this quote. And, and the messenger to the remnant says, in Desire of Ages 382, paragraph 1, when trouble comes upon us, how often are we like Peter? We look upon the waves instead of keeping our eyes fixed on the Savior. Our footsteps slide and the proud waters go of our souls. Jesus did not bid Peter come to him that he should perish. He does not call us to follow him that he should forsake us. Fear not, beloved. In the book of Isaiah 43, 1 to 3, he says, For I have redeemed thee, fear not. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. Through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame be kindled upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the only one of Israel thy Savior. Jesus reads the character of his disciples. Jesus knew how solely their faith was to be tried. He, in this instance on the sea, he desired to reveal to Peter his own weakness. O ye of little faith, day by day, God instructs his children by the circumstances of daily life, God is preparing his children to act their part upon the wider stage to which his providence has appointed them. It is the issue of daily test that determines the victory or defeat in life's greatest crisis. Listen to that. The issue of daily test that determines whether you will stand in the greatest crisis. Those who fail to realize their constant dependence upon God will be overcome by temptation. We may now suppose that we stand secure and that we shall never be moved. We may say with confidence, I know whom I have believed. And nothing can shake my faith in God and his word. But beloved, Satan is planning to take advantage of our hereditary and cultivated traits of character and to blind our eyes to our necessities and defects. Only through realizing our own weakness and looking steadfastly to Jesus can we walk securely.
Beloved, the only way we can be sustained is by trusting in Jesus. Let's keep our eyes on Jesus. The lesson from the giant with a little faith is that don't keep your eyes off the master at any time. We must depend on Jesus moment by moment and day by day. God bless you and God guide you all. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, didn't the songwriter say, my faith has found a resting place, not in a man-made creed. I need no other evidence. I need no other plea. It's enough that Jesus died and rose again for me. God, the songwriter said, my faith looks up to thee, O thou Lamb of Calvary. Savior divine, our faith looks up to you. The songwriter finalized by saying that faith is the victory that overcomes the world. And God, at this point in time, I request for that faith which cannot be shaken. In this day, God, you've impressed me to just emphasize on faith. Because, God, we saw a woman with a great faith in the morning. And we have seen a man with little faith this afternoon. But God, we want to be able to trust in you. So God, let us keep our eyes on you, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. The Lord bless you all, and the Lord keep you safe. Mm -hmm.